this third episode of the uh, dental water cooler for the ultimate patient experience. I'm David Moffat, I'm your host for this evening and the topic this evening that we're going to be discussing and you join in at any time is how to make your dental practice completely different and more successful. That's what we want, isn't it? We want our practice different so it attracts more people and keeps more people as patients. And we want it to be successful because what to being successful are unsuccessful. And that's not a very nice place to live with an unsuccessful business. We want our business to be successful so that it's comfortable for us. It's comfortable for us to have employees and pay them and pay them well what they do. And therefore it's comfortable for our customers knowing that our practice is successful, that it will be around for the long term. Because going to the dentist is a very personal and personable uh, experience for our patients. They, uh, they all a relationship, they're looking for a friend, for somebody to look after them. So they want to make sure that uh, their dentist is successful. Otherwise, they've got to find another dentist. So uh, very important, how to make your dental practice completely more successful. We've um, got people coming on all the time at uh, for this uh, water cooler moment, and you're welcome to uh, join in unmute yourself and join in if you've got a question or you can pop a, um, a question in the, the chat box as well down the bottom of the, the Zoom application there. I'd firstly like to uh, thank our sponsor, uh, Equa Marketing. Equa Marketing is uh, one of our sponsors here for all the dental water cooler with the ultimate patient experience. And um, I'd like to thank them for being a, uh, a uh, to the program. Um, just reading that there. Thank you. Got it there. All right. Thank you. Okay. So. I think when uh, dentists are looking to make their dental practices more successful, sometimes what they're looking for is a magic bullet. And uh, the magic bullets, uh, if they are successful, if they do have any impact on our business, they're often very short lived and then we're off chasing the next magic bullet as well. And uh, Moving from one magic bullet in search of the next magic bullet can be very, very frustrating for us as business staff and for our customers and patients. The answer is not a magic bullet. The answer is making sure that we have our business systematized so that it is running regularly as clockwork, like a Swiss watch moving uh, in the uh, the method that we want it to maintain its success. Very, very important. So I think the, there's, uh, instead of focusing on external solution, you know, people say, you know, whenever I bump into dentists at meetings, I say, how's your business going? And they say, well, you know, I just need more new patients. And to me, that's looking for an external solution because more new patients if your systems internally are bad, then the new patients aren't gonna stay. Some may, but you're gonna waste a lot of money chasing new patients who end up leaving for the same reason patients are leaving. So focusing on the internals, and there's three internal things that you really need to focus on in your business to dif differentiate your dental practice from other dentists in the area. Uh, firstly, um, you need to focus on the structure of your office and how it is set. Well, how is the flow for patients? How do they move from one point in your office to another? Is it logical? Is it illogical? Uh, we'll cover that. We're also going to talk about handovers and whether you're using computers to transfer information or whether you're using voice and physicality, uh, people 
the visual and the and the spoken uh, to transfer information in your practice. And the more that you use computers, the the more difficult the process is going to be. The third thing is the, uh, the structure of your appointment book, your schedule. How is your schedule set up? Because your schedule needs to be set up so that every patient feels as if their appointment with you is the most important appointment of the day. And you really need to make sure that you have your, your schedule so that that feeling importance is conveyed to your patients. They're not to feel that they're rushed, they're not to feel that they're being squeezed in, that they're in the way, that they're taking up space, they're taking up time. So those three things are the main ingredients that we need to look at in terms of fixing our dental practice once and for all so that our dental practice is truly completely different, more successful. So focusing on those internals is really, really important. So let's look at the first of those internals there. And that was the office setup. Now, traditionally, um, a lot of dental practices are set up with uh, patients walk straight in through the front door and what are they greeted with? They're greeted with a, uh, an upstand uh, dental reception count. This um, kitchen counter behind me, that's a kitchen counter and then there's a kitchen behind that. And so with the upstand, what that, uh, the patient stands on this side, then on the other side, is a dental receptionist, sometimes not even a dental receptionist. On the other side is a computer and a computer screen facing in the other direction. So the patient over the upstand, over the computer monitor to hopefully somebody sitting behind that monitor. And sometimes the monitors are absolutely huge, ginormous. So we have these visual and physical impairments to creating a relationship. What's uh, any time that we put something physical in the way of creating an open relationship with someone, it makes it awkward. Have you ever had to try and greet somebody across a table, stretch out at arm's length to shake somebody's hand or to shake somebody's hand over a fence? It's awkward. And so although we're not saying anything, really, what we're physically doing is putting up between our patients and us. And that barrier with the upstand is, don't you come on my side, okay? This is my side, that's your side, you stay there. You're not allowed to look at my screen, you're not allowed to get over. And so we have this us and them mentality. What I did in my dental office um, in 2004 is when we renovated, we removed the necessity for an upstand reception counter. Patients walked into what was a lounge, chairs, comfortable chairs, coffee table, large coffee table, small screen TV, um, coffee table magazines and books. There was a computer on a monitor standing on a tall table in one corner and patients would stand there so that they, their arrival could be noted. But there was no business done at that monitor. It was purely a, um, a means of um, greeting patients. Uh, that's the whole purpose of it. Then they sat in what was basically a lounge. When I said there was a coffee table in the middle, and then there was a um, coffee table with lamps around. And we had four chairs only, four very comfortable chairs because we had uh, five treatment rooms in that practice. So there was never really any need to have people waiting in what some dental practices have is technically like a, uh, uh, a bus station. Uh, 
waiting room. You know, it's, it's like an airport uh, departure lounge. Non-comfortable chairs waiting for somebody at a gate to call them. That's That was not the image that we wanted. Um, so what... Um, what we did technically was uh, to remove the upstand, excuse me, scratching, and we removed that upstand basically by um, the point is to have a chain, take a chainsaw to the upstand. Now, when you think of the purpose of the upstand, what we wanted to do was to um, remove that barrier. What was the purpose of the upstand 50 years ago? 50 years ago when people went to the dentist, what they did was completely different to what they do now. Firstly, they often went for relief of pain. They often had an extraction. They left with a mouthful of gauze and, and blood and a wee wound in their mouth. And that upstand was actually a physical barrier to stop them from spitting uh, blood onto us. The other thing was that in the old days, uh, before credit, people used to take an account or you used to post an account. So there was no physical transaction of money taking hands. It was, yeah, send me a bill, send me a bill. Everything was, send me a bill. And of course, everything is tarot, pay wave. Uh, it's so much easier. So we need to create a comfortable environment where people are changing information, scheduling times to see each other again, handling of transactions on a coffee table, and was sitting across a desk, uh, eye to eye, knee to knee, and there is no physical barrier that they have to peer over. So we set up two private glass walled offices, arrival and departure, interview style situations. Very, very open, very modern, and um, very familiar. Uh, environment dental turn for the patients so often we found that patients were attending early they'd be sitting in there having a chat afterwards they'd be staying on having a chat it was very much a place of uh, friendship so that's um that's one thing uh, in terms of the physicality the the other thing is that at the departure when you have a departure of um, somebody standing up and somebody sitting down, you actually have this inequality. person sitting down is in a begging type situation from the person standing up. And the person standing up is also on the side closest to the door. So they can literally just run out the door if they want. So there's, there's more difficulty in creating that understanding, that relationship. So a lot of what I teach is based on things being done in the right environment. You know, you wouldn't try and schedule dental appointments sitting on two chairs side of a major freeway, would you? Because it's too noisy, it's not the right environment. Yet you try and schedule dental appointments sometimes in this environment where there's also people sitting in the background listening in very much in the same, that barbershop scene in coming to America. You know, there, there is a lack of privacy. So again, if you can set up your office so that your arrival areas and your departure areas are enclosed with privacy, but comfort, then you're going to find that you're going to get uh, fast success in scheduling appointments, keeping appointments, retaining patients, and therefore getting treatment done. And that's a win for everybody. Patient gets it done that they need, they don't walk out, they don't off, it doesn't become an emergency for them. Uh, your book gets filled and scheduled because you're able to convey these inf this information on a um, personable uh, um, basis, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, as opposed to with an audience of people listening and also comfortably in a, a seated environment as well. Very, very important to do it that way. Really, really important. So... Um, that's one in terms of the physicality. The second thing about the physicality is the flow of patients through your office. How do patients get from different points? How do they come in 
to the client lounge. From the client lounge, how are they then transferred to the treatment room? Once they're in the treatment room, how are uh, in the treatment room? And then how are they brought back out to the area where their appointments are scheduled, um, where financial arrangements are made and their dental future is um, documented, recorded and um, cast, so to speak, in stone so that they keep those appointments. If you can't do those sort of things, then again, you're pushing it uphill in trying to get that customer service style situation. I uh, worked with a dental practice in upstate Pennsylvania where they had six hygienists and two dentists every day. And yet they only had three, count them three, front office treatment coordinators to schedule appointments and do financial arrangements. So every hour there was eight people coming out, but only three. So we all know the frustration when we go to the grocery store, when we go to the department store, and there's only cashiers, and they may have more, but there's a line. And have you ever seen somebody actually just leave a trolley and um, or leave a, a shopping basket and go because of the time taken is um, the received to be needed is greater than the time they have and they just leave it and run. They'll get it another time. My Nordstrom Rack, she, she, she walks out with a big armful of shoe boxes and there's only three uh, cashiers on and they've got eight registers. And she says that that's not sending a good buying signal to her that her business is valuable. So again, the flow from the treatment room to the uh, process of scheduling appointments and the process of of um, doing the financials needs to be one of respect because often you'll see practices where they will leave the, the treated patient and go and do cleanup and then the patient forgets what needs to be done or the message that they were given becomes forgotten and it has to be resurrected again by the uh, front office receptionist, the treatment coordinator, the, the uh, appointment schedule, or the financial controller. So again, what is your process, internal process, this transition from treatment room to front office logistics uh, to analyze so that it's seamless and the patient leaves with that appointment, leaves with certainty, leaves with an understanding as to exactly what is going to be done next time. And so a lot of what I teach do that, if your office isn't built for that, then sometimes you're creating extra work, extra distraction for a process that in my office working very, very well. So sometimes the inconvenience of restructuring your office so that things flow very, very well is uh, really, really important. Otherwise, again, you're trying to do things with one arm tied behind your back. Just excuse me one moment. Excuse me, just need to scratch. Excuse me, just itchy. Oh. Put my video back on. There we go. Um, thank you for that. So I hope you have that understanding. That's the first of the, the three is the, the office. The second the, of the three is the, the handing over of the patient. So at the completion of the examination, the completion of the hodge, at the completion of uh, treatment appointment, what are the processes that we're using in our dental office to transfer the patient and the information to the front? so that we have maximum effect so that the patient knows exactly what they've got to have done next time uh, and why it needs to be done in the time frame that we're telling them. Because I go to dental offices and I go to specialists and the patient sometimes walks out on their own up to the front office and the front of the information to come up on the computer. Well, guess what happens? 
more than it should. At that moment, the front office person is relying on a digital record of conversation and physical appointment being transmitted to her and she has to then sell what was done and she has to sell the next appointment. That's more difficult than if somebody who worked in the treatment room, the dental assistant or the hygienist comes out and brings the patient out and verbally and physically hands over the patient with the information that needs to be conveyed, being spoken and being recognised by the departing patient. So the spoken word is far more powerful than the digital word. But I see so many times because some geek event or you can put this chat box in the computer dental software that'll save the dental assistant going out the front she can then clean up the room quicker they can see more patients but guess why they need to see more patients because patients are not making appointments remember children spell love d-i-m-e and your patients will spell love the exact same way and they want you to love them they really do so we need to be concentrating on spend time with patients. So we need to have a dental assistant who will take the patient out and convey to the dental front office team these five very important things that happen during the... This one is they tell the, the front office team exactly what the patient had done today, what treatments were completed, how many teeth, how many surfaces, the size of the restorations. The next thing that they will do is let the patient know any possible um, feelings that they may have following the aesthetic wearing on and between now and the next visit. Those were deep feelings. You could uh, experience some discomfort or sensitivity because the setting happens in a certain number of cases. You know, sometimes 15, sometimes 20% of people will have some discomfort that can last one week, sometimes two, occasionally three weeks. Um, the sensitivity is usually just the feeling settling in. It's um, only a very small number of people actually get that far and um, it's because of the, the size of the filling and how close the decay was to the nerve. So give the patient that, that um, perception that there is a chance, not a big chance, but there is a chance of them experiencing some discomfort as a result of the treatment that they had done because of the decay that was in their tooth. Very, very important. So, Patients love to be informed, kept informed, and they need that clarity. Really important that they have that clarity. So um, things about the treatment. The next thing is it's the dentist's responsibility to let the patient know exactly what the dentist is going to be doing next time. What are they going to be doing next time? Not what somebody else is going to do. What do, you, what do you do for this patient next time this patient is in? Let them know what's the next most important thing for you to be doing for the patient. Can I remove that uh, tooth with a crack in it? We're going to be placing a crown on it. We're going to need you for an hour. We're going to be taking an impression. And um, afterwards, we're going to replace that uh, missing tooth structure with a temporary crown till the, the finished pull and crown is completed. So we're definitely taking control. We're not giving the patient a use because how many times has that happened in the past where you've had a couple of hour appointment for you know, some significant restorative procedure and the patient comes in and they, they've got out the treatment plan. They go, can I just have that little one down here done? 10 minutes or you've um, allocated two hours because you're going to do a quadrant up here and now you can't do that quadrant because you've actually given the information, you've put the patient in control 
of what's needed and when. Whereas, wouldn't it have been great if you're seating a crown over here, I can numb this one up, I can do it at the same time, it saves that extra appointment. So again, look at how we're scheduling the appointments for the, um, the patient. Uh, so the, the most important things get done first. So it's the dentist who creates the urgency. The dentist then says, I'm going to be doing a crown on that tooth. Uh, the reason being is that there's a crack in that tooth. Crown is going to protect the tooth. And uh, I've got a time next week. I'd like you to come in. And let me tell you this. If I get a change in my book between now and next week, I'm going to be calling you to move that appointment because I want to make sure none of that tooth structure disappears. None of it. So really, really important for the dentist to create urgency. The dentist has to in the next appointments are so that he can let the patient know. Uh, no point in the dentist saying, look, I need to see you as soon as possible and there's nothing for six weeks. That's a clanger. But that if the dentist says, look, Need to see you in six weeks time and this is what we're going to do. But let me tell you this, if something comes up sooner, Mrs. Brown, I'm going to be calling you because I want to see you that tooth sooner. Really, really important. Giving power to Mrs. Smith, but also making Mrs. Smith feel that she is the most important patient in the practice that when there's a change, you're going to be calling her. She's not gone on a list. So really, really important that we hand over the information that way. So that's the full, the fifth thing is the dentist has to let the patient know exactly what will happen if this treatment is not done in the time frame that we're wanting to do the treatment. So we need to form the patient uh, about what will happen. If you don't get this tooth fixed, if we don't fix this tooth next week, there's a chance this tooth could break and then you're going to have a space and then that's not going to look very good when you smile and your grandkids are going to say, Nana, what's that black space up in your mouth? So we don't want to be looking at losing um, teeth because we haven't emphasised the importance of what we need to do and what happen if it doesn't harm. So we do it with wisdom teeth. Remember, we always paint a grim picture with wisdom teeth because we want the patient to realise that no matter how good things are, they could have been worse. And we need to do that with our patients in terms of scheduling their Next dental appointment, we need to be creating an urgency that delay is not an option. We are not closing the door garage. Again, it's the same. What we're doing is we're closing the door on a rat infested garage. And so although we're not putting anything more in there, there are rats in there and they're breeding away. So we need to create this urgency and concern about the, what will happen in the time frame. So that the patient then goes out the front, says he wants to see me next week, but if something comes up sooner, I'm available. Please, I get called. I want that patient to walk out with that certainty in mind that they're going to get this tooth fixed and they're going to get it fixed as soon as possible. They're not going to put it off, put it off, put it off. The third thing that we need to look at is that, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, is the appointment book structure. What is the of our book? The best possible use of our dentist's time. We don't want them to look like a very messy um, sock drawer in your wardrobe, we want the appointment book to look like one of those uh, art shots after you've had the professionals come in and redesign your wardrobe so that all your shirts are the same colour, all lined up, all your trousers are hanging in a different spot, all your shoes are stacked up in the, in the, uh, the wardrobe correctly. 
that's what we want. We want our appointment book to look like that as well so that the dentist is using their time efficiently to create a um, practice because that's why we're here in business. We're here to make a profit and we're here to make our life easy in doing the business to create the profit. Really, really important. Uh, that's the understanding book is not for people to pick and choose when they want to come and then all of a sudden we've got a quarter hour appointment um, blocked into the of what should have been a 90 minute slot where we could have put a bridge or we could have put a couple of crowns to do so how are we utilizing the time so that we can again have maximum um, benefit of um, the dentist time because the only difference between a person who's successful and a person who's not successful is how they utilize their time and how they leverage their time and if you're a dentist and you're working on uh, a fee for service time is money you want to make sure that your time is efficiently handled really important to uh, do that we cannot cannot be um, wasting time and we all know about those days those days where you know you see 20 30 40 patients but it's all little stuff it's denture adjustments it's orthodontic appliance uh, checks hygiene um, checks sometimes and we think wow I saw 60 patients and yet I haven't even collected two thousand dollars and the overhead for this practice is more than two thousand dollars per day how did that happen because we haven't looked at finding work that needs to be done, diagnosing the work that needs to be done and uh, scheduling it and doing the work that needs to be done. The other thing with the appointment um, book structure is to be able to go and do examinations in the hygiene room at a regular time for each patient. So here's the scenario. Mrs. Smith comes in for her six monthly clean and uh, today the doctor's running early, so he's going to examine her teeth before the, the hygienist begins the, the, the cleaning process. Um, now it gives the dentist an opportunity to look at the state of the patient's mouth uh, as opposed to it being beautified by the hygienist, but it's really important that the patient feels that the examinations are done at a regular time that's the best time for them and what we found was that the best time for the dentist to do the uh, hygiene room examination was at the 40 minute mark in the hygiene appointment because this is the time that the patient has had um, their teeth cleaned with finished the cleaning, we've finished the oral hygiene instruction and the next hygiene appointment is already made and the examination's been done pretty well by the dental hygienist. They've collected the records, photos, um, radiographs and they're able to present them to the doctor and present their findings to the doctor. Really important that that's what the process involves is presenting those findings to to the doctor so the doctor can then make the clinician's view and um, do that without having to actually go through the process of discovery themselves. It's a, a, a diagnosis by second opinion, <coughs> excuse me, doctor making the, um, doctor making the uh, the second diagnosis following the recommendations of the hygienist. Now, can't do that if the dentist coming in when it suits the dentist. So dentist coming in at the start of the appointment, dentist coming in middle of the cleaning appointment, dentist coming in at the end of the cleaning appointment. Times hygienist moved on to another patient and the patient's left there uh, reading a book, watching television. They've got no idea what the hygienist has said and the hygienist doesn't come back to do the examination with the dentist and the dentist is in a hurry and nothing gets done, nothing gets booked not done booked, and then they get cancelled so really important to make sure that the hygiene appointment is revolves around the dentist being 
being able to access the hygiene room at the 45 minute mark to do the referral examination. If we don't do that, then we're not making that hygiene patient feel important. And it's just, yeah, you know, it's five minutes. Sometimes it's even less, but it's just a matter of the dentist getting up, walking down to the hygiene room and saying, thanks, Emily, for uh, doing the examination. Let's have a look at what that you want to check and doing it. <coughs> Excuse me, really, really important. So I've seen dental practices where the dentists are so caught up in their own uh, persona that they don't take stock of what they're doing with their patients. And the relationships with the patients fall over. They fail because the dentist hasn't looked after the patient. The dentist hasn't spent time with the patient and they haven't built the structure organization around the patient so that other dental team members can look after the patient as well. So I've done a lot of talking today in terms of what I believe needs to be in terms of creating a very successful dental practice more successful than you can imagine and completely different because what we need to do is we need to be talking with the patient about them we need to be creating that relationship so it's not a matter of going like going to the post office and standing in line we want our patients to feel that they have a relationship with our doctors they have a relationship with our staff our clinical staff and they have a relationship with our clerical staff so when you do that and build the systems building that ultimate patient experience thought in your team's mind. How do I create an ultimate patient experience for this patient? What do I do to create an ultimate patient experience for this patient? Really important that that is front of mind always and looking at it from the internal side of the office as opposed to the external. The external is, oh, I just need more new patients. Oh, I've got the wrong sort of patients. Well, that's not the case. People are people are people. And so when I moved to my new home out of Sydney uh, six years ago, which we've shared, what I found was that it was about the relationships. It wasn't about production line stuff. It was about spending time with people. There is no silver bullet for this. It's building your own structure, getting it on board to build it and own it for themselves. Really, really important. So I think that we've covered enough. I've done uh, a lot of talking. I'm just wondering if there is any questions out there from any of the participants, uh, because if there's not, um, all I'm left to do, uh, let you know uh, about the the next um, water cooler meeting in January, and I'm sure that that water cooler meeting is going to be Tuesday, the eighth of January. Um, I have a question. You're talking yeah. about prioritizing uh, about your patients when you need to get somebody in earlier. If you have several patients that you think really need an appointment earlier, how does your staff know the priority? Well, at the start of each day at Puddle, the best to do is to, uh, to know who we need to see and and who we're going to call if we get a change in our book. They're, they're, as much as we'd like to think that there aren't changes, there are. They're, we want to make changes as possible, but if there is a change in our book and everybody is who has an appointment is framed in such a way that they believe that they're the only person ever going to be called, they're actually, we've, we've created a... Uh, 
a list in our mind of all our patients who say, yeah, call me, bring my appointment forward. So in my office where more people wanted their appointment brought forward than wanted to leave their appointment where it was. Whereas sometimes dentists set it up so poorly that the patients, you know, book their appointment for six weeks in advance and they don't want to bring them forward. Well, that's purely because they aren't framed up correctly to start off. Sometimes um, the other thing is constant communication. Again, it's communication between the doctor and the, the scheduling coordinator. Um, nothing pleased me more than receiving a note while I was working that says, I've had a change in my book for tomorrow. Who do you want me to um, put into that slot tomorrow? Do you want me to put in this patient who we spoke about this morning? Or is there somebody else that you've seen today that you would like put in as well? So, the important thing is that those appointments, those changes in your book are managed so that again, we maximize who goes in. Nothing more frustrating for a dentist working on a patient, glances at his computer and sees there's a, a space in his book come up and then sees that somebody's put the wrong patient into that space and the patient that he's working on now could have been perfect for that space tomorrow but nobody came and asked him. So it's creating that flexibility too. So it's, it's managing the appointment book to the betterment of the practice, but also to the betterment of the patient. Every patient feels important. So you do, if, say we have a, 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 a vacancy tomorrow morning and we had a patient in today morning and we found that they needed an hour appointment and we had an hour tomorrow. What we would do is we wouldn't suggest to that patient, oh, look, I've got an hour tomorrow, I'm gonna to put you straight in there. What we'd do is we'd schedule them for you know, a week down the track and, we, and we'd say, look, I, there's a chance I might have an appointment come up to, until later this morning. Would you like that appointment if it becomes available? And the patient goes, yes. So we haven't given the appointment to the patient in front of us now departing, but what we have done is we've kept our option open in case something else more important comes up. Because if we'd have put that patient in there and it's not urgent because it could have waited till next week when we were gonna schedule them, but we brought, put them because we had a vacancy, uh, all of a sudden a, a, a true emergency comes up and we can't put them in. So I call that, um, that condition of putting names in slots without thinking, call that white space disease. The dental office team members see whites think, oh, I've got to get a name in there and now I've got a name in there, my job is done, as opposed to who's the best person to be put in there. And sometimes we will have sort of situations where uh, you know, we, we might have one or two people who we might be going to bring forward into those appointments and we hold off. We know that either of those people can come in with one or two hours notice. So we hold off till that last moment before we, we put them in just in case that appointment could be used more uh, efficiently. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. I have one more question. A lot of patients like the ability to book online using services like ZocDoc. What are your thoughts? Can that come into play in any way with being able to set up an appointment book efficiently? Again, um, this wasn't around when I was in, in practice, but it is, uh, I, I know some of my clients who have trouble managing their appointment schedule. So because they get, uh, they have high cancellation rates because they don't create the urgency and concern. So everything comes back to the handover. And so that, you know, somebody rings up and cancels. I say, well, look, I can't get you in for six weeks. And the patient says, yeah, all right. So they make the appointment for six weeks and then they're in the book for tomorrow because they're, they're online using your uh, online um, appointment scheduling and you've got the spaces out there publicly that you've got time to put people in. So, um, it's a two-edged sword now, isn't it, with the online? Because people want to be able to book in instantly online without having to physically talk to somebody. But in dentistry, we need to 
make sure that we're allocating the right time for the right people. Sometimes people are doing it the wrong way around. Sometimes people are making appointments uh, for something that they think is urgent and it's not urgent. And other times they're not making appointments for things that are urgent that uh, if they called and spoke to someone, uh, we would understand that it was a more important appointment that needed to be made than the urgency that is in the patient's mind. So those um, facilities for online, uh, so in the US, ZocDoc, in Australia, Health Engine, um, those facilities uh, are important for creating a content specialist schedules an appointment, having somebody from your office then call the patient just to clarify what exactly they need. So as opposed to leaving it as, oh, somebody's booked in, good, we got somebody in. And then, you know, we find out they've got a chip too, but it's actually just a, a large piece of tartars chipped away from behind their lower incisors. And they really needed to see the hygienist, not the dentist. And all of a sudden an hour of the dentist time is wasted. So um, there's a whole management process with contacting those people when they schedule in that manner. Um, difficult, difficult to master, but it is something that is able to be mastered as well. That makes sense? Yes, it does. That's very clear. Yeah. So we, it, time is the, is the ultimate resource. We've all got the same amount of time. It's how we that determines our worth in the marketplace to ourselves, to our business, um, to the dividend that we get out of life. You know, there are dentists out there who are very, very busy and they're busy not making any money. They're wearing themselves out like uh, hamsters on a wheel and yet they're not profitable because they haven't structured their uh, appointment correctly so that they maximize their revenue for the time that they have. So the only difference between Warren Buffett and me is how we utilize our time with our money invested. We've got 24 hours. He just utilizes his time a lot better and his investments, I suppose. So, did I, I cover the, uh, the call next, uh, next month, Tuesday, the 8th of January, same time, 8 p.m. East, topic the gift, uh, giving, is the act of giving gifts at a dental office, is that uh, a part of what are we sending the wrong message? So sometimes our gifts too cheap and they're damaging our image as opposed to maintaining our image of being world class. So what sort of gifts are we willing to offer to our patients that add a value to service that we, that we provide and two services, you know, the dental service and the customer service as well. Um, I know dental practices that always give the hygiene patient a toothbrush and you know, some hygiene patients respect that toothbrush by calling it the, uh, the $200 toothbrush, uh, my $200 toothbrush. So their perception is that their cleaning appointment for $200 is irrelevant and all they have at the end of it is a toothbrush and their $200 lighter in their wallet. So well, are we better off not giving them a toothbrush so that at least they realize that that $200 was for the service that we provided in terms of the, the dental cleaning, the dental education, the discovery, um, the planning of the patient's um, oral care, ongoing oral care and management so that they maintain their oral health as opposed to just turning up for a clean. That's one. The other things is what sort of gifts are we offering our patients as um, thank yous for being great patients, thank yous for being good referrers, um, 
thank yous for um, giving us great reviews as well. Can we do that depending on your um, various legislations in states, whatever. So that's what we're going to cover next time, Tuesday the 8th of January at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. The next uh, dental water cooler um, meeting for the ultimate patient experience. I'd like to just uh, one more time just thank um, Equa Marketing as our major sponsor. I need to thank them again and um, thank you. If you would like to leave comments, you can do that. I'm just, just cut and paste this um, link for some feedback. I'm going to do this one handed. Go, got it. I'll just leave it in the, the chat section here now. And if you'd like to go and leave some feedback, feedback. Here's the dentalwatercooler.com forward slash doctor dash Moffat dash feedback forward slash. So for being on this uh, water cool really appreciate it and i uh, look forward to talking to you next month if you need to contact me between now and then email in the updates david at the upe.com david at t-h-e-u-p-e.com very much have a great uh, tuesday night uh, those of you in australia wednesday afternoon and uh those of you celebrating Christmas, you a, a Merry Christmas and um, greetings of the season. Happy New Year. Keep safe. Uh, be grateful for your gifts that you receive and give generously. Christmas is a time of giving. All the very best and um, talk to you in the new year. Thanks very much.